Maybe let's get started. It's a pleasure to, uh, to have Marco tell us about the Monte Carlo approach to the Macron Augusta. We started five minutes later. Thank you, thank you very much. So thank you to the organizer for inviting me to give this talk so, and for this great workshop. So I'm going to talk about this work done with Alessandro Raio and Ure Lubiano, both at SISA, based on this paper. So let me make a disclaimer at the beginning. So this is going to be a completely non-rigorous approach to the Roma book. It will be clear from the title, and as long as you see the word Monte Carlo, equal non-rigorous. But I want to make it clear because one of the reasons we like the Gonforma Booster is because of its, uh, I mean, it's typically is contrasted with the Monte Carlo result as, uh, you know, the main key point is the, the, the rigor of the results. So here it's not rigorous, so a bit of a mixture between the Gonforma Booster and the Monte Carlo, so you might like it or not, but that's what it is, okay? So, no rigorous approach. <coughs> so being essentially a new, well, uh, an attempt to, to, so approaching a different way the Gonforma Bootstrap as opposed to the usual uh, uh, functional myth, numerical functional methods that are uh, the state of the art today. Uh, so uh, this is going to be essentially a proof of concept that this idea might lead to somewhere, not obvious, but that's the hope. And then essentially, although there will be some quantitative results, I will say that uh, if there is anything interesting, it's going to be qualitative at this stage. And then we might discuss if uh, we can uh, upgrade this qualitative result to some more quantitative results. Okay. So since uh, not all of you, I believe, are uh, just numerical performance bootstrap experts, let me say a few words that might be boring for some of you. So the, uh, the numerical performance bootstrap, as you know, is a, it's a great tool. It's basically, it's, uh, uh, it's in, in the sense of a dual versus primal, it's a dual formulation which we exclude rigorous theories, and then uh, we don't know whether in some region in the parameter space of the consumer theory data will be proficient in scaling dimension, whether uh, the theory can be there or not. So, the prototypical example of which will be from now on the typical graph that you will see badly drawn. For from me. By the way, the fact of giving a blackboard talk for this kind of talk is going to be hard, but uh, uh, I will try to do my best. So, uh, okay, I will, I will use some icing model uh, terminology for the uh, fields. So, sigma is going to be the external field, the scalar field in my future uh, correlator that we are going to see. Epsilon is going to be the first operator beyond the identity. So the prototypical bootstrap uh, bound is something like this. All of you know this. So this is, uh, let's say, in three dimension. This is where uh, the icing model is supposed to stay. And uh, we like it because this is uh, this allowed region. This is the allowed region. And so this is already great by itself. And sometimes, like in the icing model, now we have this law that any time you see a feature along the extremality line, such as a key, this is an indication that the physical theory can be there. And uh, then you can focus on this region using some, uh, you know, extending the correlator to multi-correlator, imposing extra gaps. At the end, you can even isolate here. And having the, the allowed region becomes almost just a little higher. Uh, and this is great because at the end it allows you to be quantitative and uh, getting the scaling dimension. Okay, so this is a beautiful story, one of the most beautiful stories in the, in the numerical of Magusta, uh, and this is absolutely great. So uh, the the law, if you wish, the well, the law, the, the technology we have at the moment is that any any time the theory sits a special point at the extremality region, this is uh, an indication of of a CFT. And more in general, any time you are at the externality line, so along here, you are not sure whether there is a CFT or not, but there is another tool which is not as rigorous as this picture here, but still, compared to my standard here, it's going to be rigorous, which is the extremal functional method. So there is a way in which if the theory lives here, you can actually compute the CFT data. You don't know whether this is actually a CFT or not, but at least you can get the CFT data. 
So the moral of this story is that any time that the bootstrap is great to disallow regions, it's great whenever you are in the extremality region, but doesn't tell you much about the interior of this region. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, if you wish, the point. Uh, this interior, of course, depends, you know, depending on the assumption, this interior it can be carved out. Okay, for instance, uh, just a given example, the, the, the notable example of the icing model, if you add extra gaps, extra correlators, so this, this picture can change it into this one. Right? But you know to know which assumption to use, which correlator to use. So there are a lot of information to go from here to here. It's not obvious. So typically, we don't know. If suppose there is a nice theory here, which kind of assumption are going to give you a little island here? That would be great. Right? But we, don't have, we are not at, at this, uh, at this uh, moment now. So the idea here, the main motivation for me to, to do this crazy idea of putting Monte Carlo with metals and conform a bootstrap together is a way to characterize this allowed region. So what's going on here? Is there any feature? Is there any pattern? Is this uh, completely chaotic? So to say, just referring to Tom, to Tom uh, lecture, or there is some special places where, say, the bootstrap equation are going to be more easily satisfied. Okay, so this is the kind of question I'm going to ask. And if you wish more ambitiously, I will ask even a more quantitative question. Suppose that you give me some safety data, just a bunch of truncated safety data, a finite number of safety data, random, just looking at features of scaling dimension. Is there a way that I can cook up a method to tell you whether uh, with appropriate numbers, finding the appropriate optical fish in the spin dimension, whether I can find a safety, approximate safety, which has a specific spectrum with the, with the operators that you gave me. So, in other words, given a set of, a given number of operators in some spin sector, then is there any put that in approximate solution to the process? When I say safety, by the way, this is a big name. When I say safety, I mean simply a bunch of safety data that satisfy one single crossing relation for one or three function. So the, the way to get the consistent safety is quite, uh, quite complicated. And in general, even <coughs> the usual rigorous booster, this is hard to say, right? You, you will have uh, to satisfy crossing an <coughs> infinite number of correlators. And if you want to be very rigorous, even for, for uh, uh, extended operators. But we are completely far from this. So, um, so essentially, uh, so this is the idea. This is the motivation. I'm trying to understand a bit if there is any pattern here. And uh, yeah, and let's see what uh, what will we get. So before uh, reach, before telling you what we get, of course, I have to explain in the method. So what we are doing practically. What does it mean when we have approach to the performance? Okay, so. The method is going to be easy, it's very easy, this talk is very easy, by the way, it's, 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 it's a completely elementary talk. So, um, so I'm going to focus to the simplest case of four identical scalars. The fourth one function of four identical scalars, so sigma, sigma, sigma. I will focus mostly in two, three, and four dimensions. Uh, as you know very well, the bootstrap equation for this setup is simply uh, to sum over the usual coefficient coefficient square, sigma, sigma, O L times this is the sum of the other the identity is written here as an external let me write it in this way. Uh, well, I don't think I need to write for you what is, but okay, maybe for those of you that, a few of you may not know, this is the Zinzibara, the Dolanos board coordinates, uh, cross ratio, these are the blocks, those are not blocks. Okay. 
So what we are going to do, severe truncation. So we truncate the sum here up to some states. So you keep only the lighter states, with some cutoff beta star. By the way, I forgot to tell you, this method is, uh, uh, well, not rigorous, rough, but it's uh, incredibly flexible, so you can study everything, essentially anything that comes to your mind, in particular non-unitary theories. I will focus most of my talk to unitary theories, only at the end I will show you a bit, uh, just the proof of concept for a young model. So if you regard it as imposed, that if you put a cutoff on delta star, automatically you have a cutoff on the, on the maximum spin exchange that you can have. So, so I'm imposing the unitarity. <coughs> we will have that the L star, there will be an L star which is related to delta star. Um, okay, it's not going to be important, but in my case, I, this is actually, we we'll take it to this to be just a little bit beyond the unitarity bound. I spin not contribute much. The small twist, I, I, I spin contribute a little bit, but this is good enough. And then what we do? So uh, we we take some points in the in the uh, z plane, say n z points. You take it randomly or on a grid. You can do anything you like. Just take n z points. Um, we shouldn't be too close to zero or one or to the region where the conformal block expansion does not converge very well. You know there is a relation, depending on delta star, there is a region that you can reliably draw, so you should stay away. But essentially, just to be on the safe side, we will be very close to the Euclidean crossing symmetric point one half, z and z bar equal one half. Okay. So you can sample uh, points around that, so a the number of empty points. And then you can define uh, just the matrix. This becomes now it's a discretized. We have a bunch of, of the delta. And also we take, not only we take a cutoff, we take a discrete spectrum. So we assume mm -hmm. that there are n l n i Operators exchanged in the spin sector i. Remember that this i is even for identical scalars. And this is going to be another important number, which are the number of operators exchanged. So I declare that uh, I look at the sum of truncated the crossing symmetric equation where there are a bunch of operators, some scalars, spin 2, spin 4, and so on, which are, uh, uh, which are exchanged, and that's it. So it's a, it's a specific spin partition of, of the correlation function. Of course, we don't know in general these numbers, but we take some specific numbers here. And then um, okay, so this is a trivial algebra now. So this becomes the delta. We can define a matrix of this kind. Delta A, A now and runs over all possible operators at the given spin and also over the uh, over the, uh, the spin. So this is a tradition, this is an N of ox times N Z matrix. Okay. And then I rewrite the uh, bootstrap equation in the following way. discretizing also in the cross ratio so this is uh, uh, this is what it is okay this is the discrete version of this this whole now if you truncate of course this is no longer supposed to be zero of course this is going to be a small number it will be a reminder okay this is going to be zero we take it to be zero but this is in principle supposed to be a small number only the limit to when delta star goes to infinity this is you are supposed to satisfy crossing exactly okay 
And then what do we do? So this is one of the key points. We introduce what is called an action, which is simply for rho of a. Sorry, I forgot to define. Rho of a is the OP square sigma sigma of a. Okay. So I define an action which is uh, simply uh, defining the, the exponential of uh, the total sum over all possible points a sort of be a sort of an integral of the modulus square of this object. This variance here is up to you, but uh, so what we are, we are taking here, we are taking uh, this module uh, at each point, which I mean these two times, we take the module square, and then we weight each of these of these sums with a given variance, which I'm going to tell you in a second, and then we sum the all possible points. Okay. Again, in the limit which the star goes to infinity, this is supposed to be zero individually. So this S is supposed to be minus infinity. Okay. So in the limit in which delta star goes to infinity, given a put a big CFT, so for the CFT, crossing the satisfied means that S has to go to minus infinity, such that this is zero. Okay? So sigma i here we take it to be, so this is an arbitrary choice. The choice that can work. So it's the, the the combination of blocks here with the highest operate, scalar operator of dimension that the star evaluated at the point of zero. This is such a way that uh, all points more or less are weighted in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an equal manner. Okay? Otherwise, you will be dominated by the too much of the point, uh, the Euclidean point uh, close to one. Okay, so uh, now let, let me tell you right away why this, which uh, you, might, you might think it's probably the best things that came, uh, I mean, that came come out to your mind 50 years ago to the, probably to Slava Alessandro, the original, <laughs> since the original paper. Why this is naive is not my book. So why this is uh, this naive, uh, completely naive approach to solving uh, <coughs> try to attempt to, to solve the boost, to relate the booster equation in this way is not going to work. So just to be clear, what is the idea here? The idea here is that you don't know neither the OP coefficient nor mm -hmm. the scaling dimensions. So there are two n ops unknown here. And the idea is that uh, you want to minimize this S with respect to these unknowns such that to find what you would say is some putative CFT solution. So I set of the data that some spectrum. Okay, that's it. So there, there are two immediate problems to this idea, which we will try to solve or at least alleviate. So the first one, which is the most important problem, is that uh, S, uh, well, first of all, okay, what is S? S, we can call it a sort of a potential, right? We can, we can look at this as a potential, so we can have a, a quantum field interpretation if you wish, just for uh, intuitive, uh, uh, the sort of, of, of intuitive picture. Delta A and rho A, we can look at them as just coupling in a, in a quantum field theory, so we have an infinite number of, in a normal normalizable theory, so an infinite number of interaction, and uh, this is a sort of effective potential. You have look at the minimum of the effective potential, which in this case is a sort of a runaway, so it's actually minus infinity. And then you can imagine uh, in an infinite dimensional space, or if you wish, if you truncate some finite dimensional truncation to the leading uh, irrelevant operators here, that you have a complete complicated landscape in which at each point you have some CFT data, and actual solutions are all only at the bottom of this land. It's, it's, it's actually a landscape at the minus one, because here the, the landscape is going to be a minus infinity, so solution is wobbler. Anyhow, you have this uh, complicated structure of CFT data, and the actual CFT satisfied crossing are a set of measure zero, which is simply the bottom of this potential. Okay? 
So the, um, if you look in this way, S of course will never be infinite if you truncate. So what we are really looking at is some sort of minimal extraction. Okay. Sorry. Yes. I guess you mean that it's not like infinite with a specific relation between n ops and n zero. Like this, I, don't know. I mean, if this is some equation, if I have more variables than. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. When that last time goes to infinity, n ops has to be has to go to infinity. This is what you you meant. No, but even for finite delta star, yes, you. Do you want to take uh, NZ greater than an ops or something like that? Yeah, yeah, NZ is greater than an ops, yes. Okay. Actually, way greater than <laughs> Just before uh, some blah, 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 let me also give you the figures of, uh, of the numbers we are going to take. Okay, so NZ is going to be of order of hundreds, <coughs> actually 200. And ops is going to be of order 20 and delta star is going to be of order 15 just to give you some figures okay. but this is of course up to you so the idea is that you want to look at minimum this action but you see the, 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 we, this is one of the points we, we would like to understand nobody tells you what is the pattern what is the structure of this action in the, in the CFT parameter space it's complicated, it's most likely to be glassy okay, so we expect this probably S as a glassy feature uh, glassy structure which, we, which is by the way what you would expect particular at high delta star where we know with heavy operators we generically use it many many operators completely chaotic so it's very glassy with a lot of minima it's a mess just a mess this new way which you can minimize in particular so suppose let me just draw a very simple one dimensional let's take here some uh, let's say some delta this is going to be uh, and from time to time you may get uh, so this is, let's say, the, let's say this is e to the s, just to make it zero. So e to the s, so this will be many, many minima. From time to time, we will have a minimum <coughs> zero. So this is a CFT. Actually, this is an actual CFT. And all the other minima, these are just fake. So s is supposed to have many, many minima, most of which are just fake. Nothing to do with any CFT whatsoever. Okay. So you see that if you start with any Newton or gradient descent technique, so you start with an arbitrary uh, of CFT data, which means you start at an arbitrary point here, let's say here, you can do deterministically. There is a way to minimize, which is again, whatever, gradient descent of Newton, is the one I know, but that will be out of many of this. This way, this way you will uniquely go here. But that is going to be fake, right? So there is absolutely no way in which you can know where you land with any deterministic method. Unless, of course, you are so smart that you know the safety input data. There's been somehow somebody told you that the safety is around there and that would, would imply that you know that you should start here. But if you don't have this information, you typically don't have this information, you are doomed. There is no way in which you, you can get anything out of this. Sorry, this, uh, this picture, is it, um, uh, I mean, is, is it an experimental picture or do you have understanding like... No, this is, a, a, this is absolutely a cartoon, it's, it, it's, it, 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 there is no, no, no. So when you, when you do this kind of experiment, do you see it, something like this? We see, the, we, we see a glassy picture, yes, okay. but now this is a, a, just an example. And the fact that there are no CFTs around is like, I don't know, you can look around the easy model island and you see a lot of these fake minima or something like yeah. that. Well, uh, this is uh, one of the part I, I'm doing here with the so, so the first thought is that uh, are there really minima or there are values? So uh, do we show, I mean, for instance, if we have a CFT with marginal couplings, if we have a conformal manifold, <coughs> we know that we should have values, not individual minima. So there are situations which uh, I've been cheating a bit just for pedagogical reasons. So this cannot be true, because in other direction, this might be simply <coughs> This is something we are going to see. So there are valleys. There are not, uh, this is not glassy with individual minima. There are valleys and individual minima and a lot of mess. Of course, we don't have an understanding of this allowed region at all. We have just started to explore it. 
uh, but yes, yes, they, they, might, they might be. So if you take a slice, so let's say you fix all the other scaling dimensions, let's suppose some of which I told you, then in one, this is most likely to be the case. In one, in the other <laughs> okay. But the point here I wanted to make is simply that if you start randomly, you go nowhere. And the other point, you see that I, 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 I took a specific spin partition, which is already a lot of information. So I've been, uh, in this way, I'm, I'm going to explore the, the CFT data in which uh, I have a specific number of operators exchanged in any single channel. Yes? Uh, so, so why, uh, I'm confused why this particular choice of sigma i is uh, uh, so. yeah, uh, There is no specific yeah, ex experiment. So, in principle, we can choose whatever sigma i is. Well, whatever. You have to, as I told you, the, the, the principle here is that you want to wait and you, you don't want to be dominated. You know, the conformal blocks vary a lot on the Z in, in Z and in that. Okay? So you want to be sure that your choice of this variance is not such that you are dominated by the few bunch of points which will make the, the numerical approach not very, um, not very efficient. So this is uh, far from being the most efficient uh, choice. This is just a choice that uh, we took it, uh, which roughly works. Yeah, I cannot define it too much. Sorry, you could have done the same with the images. Did you try both? Yeah, very good, yes. Um, OK, let me ask you, let me answer now. So uh, this has been a sort of uh, evolution in, in, in time in, of, of the project. So since this is Monte Carlo, at the very beginning, we thought it's better to have everything random, which means at the very beginning, these points have been, were chosen randomly. If you do that, of course, you cannot use any derivative method. Only after a lot of work, we realized that there is not, you don't gain too much in having a randomness in the Z points, randomness within a region. Uh, you can choose a grid, and at that point, you can choose derivative, indeed. But at that point, it was too late. We developed all this machinery, but then, yes, I mean, most likely uh, imposing derivatives that we know it's more efficient than a random points. I mean, I personally know this. <laughs> uh, it might be more efficient, yes. But anyhow, so uh, so the glassy picture is telling you that this is going to be problematic as also the spin partition. So the existence of spin tells you that in principle, if you have uh, some number of, of operators, let's say that you want, to, you want only to fix this, then in principle, you have, to, you have to try many, many partitions that this is going to be a mess. So how many scalars should I put? 10, 9, 7, who knows, right? How many spin 2, how many spin 4, spin 8, and so on. So this is going to be a nightmare. So these two are, there may be other obstacles. So this is uh, really fundamental. But this is, this is more practical, but at the end of the day, since the speed partition grows very quickly with the number of speed, these two things actually, I would say that they simply makes this kind of analysis naively not work. So the key point, and the, the reasons why I'm stressing this, because this is the key point of the, of the project, the finish of this, of this work, is where Monte Carlo ends. So the idea here, is that we want to use a method, which is, by the way, of course, very known and nothing did here, called the Metropolis algorithm. Um, in order to, to minimize this action, which, uh, which is, by the way, it's, uh, you may know, it's the one used in lattice. Most of Monte Carlo lattice analysis makes use of this metropolis, most likely of much more advanced than the one I'm using. But uh, the key idea is this one, in particular lattice QCD, they do this. Okay? So the idea is that if you want to, just let me say, if you want, if you want to, 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 to study lattice QCD, you have, to, you have to, do, to make a path integral. Okay? But how to choose the configuration that you want to use? You have, to be, you have to be very careful on that because if you, are, if you are close to a saddle, you don't want to be, and you use again a gradient descent uh, uh, deterministic methods, you are going to take a lot of configuration around the given saddles, but that will be completely fake. You are not really probing the full integration measure of QCD. Let's say you are close to an instant of configuration, okay? Uh, you will do 
only, only you will only uh, grow that configuration. So you need a method that allows you to overcome the barrier, so to jump from here and probe it all the people, or at least some of them. So this is what this uh, algorithm makes. So uh, let me just uh, review the idea here. So uh, the idea is that, uh, uh, okay, so let me now go more specific to what we do in practice. So in practice, this, uh, the, uh, our work uh, is, is as follows. So you start with some delta A of, uh, of zero and some rho A of zero. Sorry, delta A of zero. Okay. So this is, these are the fixed values. So you choose it, okay? So the starting point, input data, some scaling dimension. Then with the scaling dimension, you minimize analytically here to get the OP coefficient. This you can always do, because uh, this is the easy part. The OP coefficient enter quadratic, uh, well, enter OP coefficient square enter linearly. If you take the square, enter quadratically. So once you give me this delta A of rho, we, uh, we can trivially minimize S to get uh, the OP coefficient. Okay. Now, okay, uh, if you pose unitarity, this might be negative, and then you don't want a negative OP coefficient, in which case you can set that to zero. If unitarity is not imposed, whatever you get are the OP coefficients. So once you have that, you will have the action of time in zero. So this zero is going to be the Monte Carlo time. So you will have an action, just a number, which will be S evaluated at delta A of zero, rho A of zero. Okay? So this is a step zero. Then what do you do? You randomly change the OP with the, the, the scaling dimension in this way. So you but you change them a little bit. You make a little change, okay? And then you evaluate, you compute a probability for accepting or not this new configuration. So the new configuration is accepted with the probability, which is uh, the minimum between uh, 1 and e to the minus S1 minus S0 over some temperature. But well, call it temperature because of the obvious analogy with the Boltzmann factor. Or if you wish, if you take it as an Antonian, it doesn't have the Boltzmann factor. So you see, this is the key point of the this <coughs> algorithm. So if S1 is less than S0, remember we want to minimize S. If S1 is less than S0, this is 1, and then the move is accepted. So we are doing it, you did a good move because you are minimizing the action. Probability 1, it's accepted. But the delta, delta, delta A is a small duration. Is it randomly generated? Yeah, I, I will, uh, I, I will uh, in a minute I will explain how delta A is taken. Okay. It's, it's not random. So, if for, for some reason S, so if S, S1 is greater than S0, which means you made, you made a bad move, you, this is not automatically rejected, but it's rejected or is, is accepted with the probability given by this number. So, this is the key point of any metropolis algorithm. You typically go toward the minimum. But you allow yourself, with some probability, to take bad moves that allow you to jump and leave the region. So if you are here, and you, you have the correct temperature, this is important, you, are, you will be able to jump. And if you, have, if you allow the Monte Carlo time to have enough time, jumping, 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 you are going to probe the old space. And eventually, the method will allow you to reach this point. Okay? This is, again, this is what is typical dynamic material. Nothing new. I'm just spending a lot of words because this is a, a conformal booster conference. It's not a material conference, right? So, uh, but this is, a, this is a completely standard in any Monte Carlo uh, configuration. Okay? So this is a, the, the key idea where Monte Carlo works. For us, Monte Carlo is simply a way to solve the crossing equation numerically. It's unknown truncated the crossing equation in a way in order to avoid uh, even if there is this glassy structure and there is a glassy structure just to be 
able to alleviate the problem of, go, of falling in a fake Okay, so this is the key point. Are there questions about this? Okay, the other point is that with you also gain another thing. If you do that, since uh, in this process of minimize, sometimes this row can be set to zero. Yes, just a, a few. Uh, mm -hmm. You see that uh, you don't need to do any steam partition. This is not needed. <coughs> because in this method, any other partition, of course, with which this and I are less mm -hmm. than the number you take, are going to be automatically improved by the Monte Carlo. So suppose I say there are seven scalars, okay? In this process of, of proving, uh, seven is certainly the maximum number of, of, of fields I can have, but six, five, up to zero, they will be proved because at some point they will be shut off by the Monte Carlo. Essentially, the, 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 the shut off meaning, meaning that there will be configuration which the OP coefficient of the scalars is uh, close to zero or zero, which is essentially a way to say that you are looking at solution with less scalars or less uh, spin. So the way which it works, you don't need to do any spin partition. You put the maximum number of operators that your uh, numerical uh, computer allow you to put. And then all the possible partition up to that number are going to be automatically proved by the Monte Carlo solution. So in this way, these two problems are either solved or alleviated. We will see that this problem is just solved. This is alleviated because this is hard to I mean, unless you know the, you know, the, 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 the full the glassy structure of the CFT, and we don't, it's hard to say that uh, we still reach a CFT or we still are in a fake minimum. This is, this is still, uh, uh, the problem is still with us, but simply only here. Yes? yes. Well, I was about to ask the spin partition. So, so you just answer my question. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so... Uh, can I, sorry, can I ask something very ignorant? Yes. Is Monte Carlo known to work well in glassy systems in general or in other I mean, Glass, uh, spin glasses or things like this? Well, in, in Monte Carlo, typically, the, in, in, in uh, Monte Carlo, it depends what you mean by Monte Carlo, right? I mean, the typical Monte Carlo is simply a way to make <coughs> integrals, summing configurations. It's a, this, it's that make, this is typically what they do, even in QCD. So, in that case, uh, I'm not totally sure if uh, the, the plain uh, Metropolis algorithm technique is enough. But here I want to contrast that we are not using Monte Carlo to make an integral, a multidimensional integral. We are doing it with a completely different purpose, so minimizing an action, or if you wish, solving the process. So the technique is the same, but the purpose mm -hmm. and, the, and the way which is implemented is totally different. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, so... Sorry, uh, are you going to comment, uh, you said on this time, hey, how small or not it must be? Yeah, yeah, sure, oh, sure. Okay. I, I mean, I think now, let me see because I'm going back in time. I'm still at the very beginning. So let me just make a comment. I will speed up a little bit. I'm seeing that I'm slowing too much. So uh, there is a T here. You see this temperature. So this is the key parameter of this, of this, uh, of this analysis. So unfortunately, this requires some art to, to find which is the best one. Uh, and uh, again, also in the Ujo Monte Carlo. So if you choose this temperature badly, well, then this is not really going to work because it's, uh, this is a quantum, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, simply a thermal fluctuation. It's uh, intuitively very clear from the picture that if, we thermal, if you are at low temperature, this thermal fluctuation is low, and this won't allow you to jump. So if you choose T too small with respect to this typical variation here, then, uh, okay, this is not going really to work. At the end, it's like having a deterministic method. You will fall to the technique. You will freeze to the first minimum you find. Or you might probe a few more, but this is not going to work. If the temperature is too large, thermal fluctuations are so large that you no longer see the pattern. I mean, you, you, you are always in the middle of anywhere. You, you, you never land to a minimum. The thermal fluctuation is so large. So the, 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 the temperature has to be in an error range where things work. So uh, high enough to jump, small enough to land to, to a minimum possibly to the global minimum of your system. Okay? Yeah, now, oh, yes. Sorry. No, you were, you were going on? No, no, no. The question about this is, uh, sorry, in, uh, when we do Monte Carlo, we don't land in a minimum of the option, right? So there's some entropy contribution, there's some detailed balance eventually, so we land in a distribution which is minimizing the free energy of the option. 
uh, how is this uh, avoided here? I mean, I understand you just fall directly on exactly on the minimum, then you don't move anymore. But yeah, but again, a, sorry. Yeah, yes, that's a, a, a correct statement. But it's uh, within uh, the use of Monte Carlo in, in doing uh, integrals or if you wish uh, evaluation of uh, configurations in which entropy consideration do matter. Here there is no the analog of this entropy configuration of that. You see simply it's a plane, well, it's complicated, but it's uh, just uh, one function, <coughs> a function of many variables in a configured way, and we minimize a single function. But uh, what, in practice, how is that different from the Monte Carlo? Wouldn't, wouldn't the entropy be just uh, if there are many, many uh, The difference in the Monte Carlo is that uh, if you have the, 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 the more parameters here, the, the more integral you have to take, and then you have to, get, you have to sample. Because if you have a, have a multidimensional integral, I have to understand what is the best region where I should integrate. Okay, and the number of parameters and the, if you wish the, the, the volume of the measure matters. Here we don't have this analogy. We are not integrating over this level. I cannot consider delta A and rho A as a spin like the Monte Carlo with easy model. I have a change of spin with a certain probability, so configuration changes and they accept exactly with that procedure, I cannot just consider that they are right as the spin variables. Yeah, but in the, in the, in the spin variables, uh, when uh, you want to make any lattice uh, configuration with any spin variable, you sum over all the possible configuration or not again. Right? This is what, what you do. I don't know. We don't sum. We don't sum. How do we sum? I think there is not a more dynamic thing. Do you, do you mind if we give uh, sure, the sure, okay. because I'm running yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. going very, very slow. So, in fact, we are, I'm running so slow that I don't think I will explain this very well. So, uh, you see that there are two elements here. One is the temperature, which I just explained to you. It has to be chosen in an appropriate way. And also this variation here. The two things are indeed related. You see that this uh, variation here, uh, you, have to be, you have to pay attention. Also, you can fix the temperature once and for all. But then you see that it's, uh, it's not trivial to understand how, how big is the step you should do. Because depending on where you are, with a given step, this, this step can be too large or too small in order to make this too small or too large. Too small or too large. If you wish, depending on where you are, this likes an effective temperature together with the actual temperature. So it, for these reasons, this has to be chosen in, a, in an adaptive way. Adaptive way. Which means uh, at every move, this delta A changes. Okay. So in the Monte Carlo, this will be automatic. So let's say, okay, just to make it uh, uh, to give you the idea, if this delta A is too small, this difference is going to be always very close, almost zero, which means that you always accept move, even when you are in the wrong direction, the move is accepted. And then this is telling you that you are taking delta A to small. And then what you do in the adaptive step, anyway, any time a move is accepted, this is a slightly increased by a factor of, say, one per minute, so to say. And, and then you iterate the process. If the move is rejected, you decrease but slightly. In this way, after a few, say, hundreds of Monte Carlo iteration, this is going to be thermalized, so to say. So the adaptive steps, at any point you are, the, the, the method knows what is the optimal step. And the optimal step is the one in which essentially 50% of the move are rejected, 50% are accepted. So this is automatic. So this is then easy to, to do. Again, what is important is to choose this parameter. Up, up. This has to be by hand. This OK, so sorry, I sorry, again. Delta delta is from a random distribution whose variance you change adaptively. Yeah, delta delta, okay, here it's really up to you. So at the end of the day, after a little bit of uh, experimental uh, trial, we, we took uh, uh, this delta delta to be uh, the same. Well, first of all, you, you might choose uh, should I move all the operators the same or depending on that. We, we, we decided to, to move all, all, all of them with the same delta delta. And the, you, the, 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 the first delta delta you choose is up to you, whatever number, so it's not randomly chosen. If we choose one, this is something you choose at the beginning, and then uh, this is going to change uh, according to the Monte Carlo in an uh, adaptive way. But at the very beginning, at time zero, you choose what is this delta A of zero. 
it's up to you. In fact, here also, the choice we are doing might very well be suboptimal. So this is uh, the There are many, I mean, here there are... You randomly uh, change one of the operators. No, 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 ah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is an important point. Thanks for asking. No. Since uh, we know that the, the bootstrap things are particularly related by analytic, by whatever, so you cannot move one operator at a time. All operators are moved uh, together. And, uh, and, uh, um, you cannot move everyone rigidly, right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. In fact, I, 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 I'm sorry. I think I, I, I say something very wrong. So the range, the interval of this depth is fixed. And then, yeah, thanks for the question, okay, because I was uh, not totally clear. So you choose uh, in a uniform random distribution within a fixed interval, so the interval is fixed, <coughs> and each operator has a random uh, move in the, in the given range. You choose the range, not the, the, the letter. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It would make any sense. So in this way, you have to be, yeah, the move is random in all operators, okay? Because of, of non-trivial correlation among among the, the blocks. Okay, so now uh, I think I will skip some other uh, details of the procedure, which, by the way, are uh, are not also that important because you can easily change. I'm not sure they are optimal, so there is no need for me to tell you the details how, for instance, how we chose these points and things like that. It's not very important. So. Uh, Maybe what is important is uh, uh, what is uh, what what we do next. Okay, so next is uh, so you do this at time zero, then at time one, of course. Then this is iteratively repeated for uh, for many times. And uh, just to give you an idea, this Monte Carlo time is uh, just to be on the same on the <coughs> same sides. We take uh, for each Monte Carlo run. This is toward uh, ten to the eight. A big number. Just to be sure that you really probe all the all the spades, all these configuration are probed, so we take a large a large number. Again, this is an explorer, it's the first time we did this, so maybe 10 to the 7 is also okay. Yeah, well. We wanted to be on the we wanted to exaggerate in this number just to be sure, but this will come at a cost, which I will uh, discuss at the end of the talk. Okay. But in the end, do you have a, a feeling about whether you are pushing a real solution or not? Is yeah, yeah, I will uh, come to the actual uh, results, to the, 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 the this qualitative, semi-quantitative results at the, at the, in, in a few minutes. Let, let, I just, just want to finish to explain a bit of the method, and then uh, I will jump to <coughs> the results. Okay, so, uh, so this is how it works. So in this way, you will have a sort of, you can look also at some evolution here. You start with some uh, configuration. This configuration evolves in time, and at some point, it thermalizes, and you reach some, some configuration. Now, in, uh, um, this is the way in which uh, in which works. But let, me, let me just tell you. So you start with some configuration uh, N0, N2, up to NL star. These are the numbers of operators at the beginning, remember? So the sum of this is M ops. <coughs> so you run this machine, and this machine is going to give you out of a single Monte Carlo run, this is going to give uh, a different set of uh, minimization. So at the end of the day, you will get a bunch of uh, configuration in which this S is, is no, is minimized. This is our, our rate, right? Um, but this will have different skin partition because as I told you, these this are going to be one single Monte Carlo will give you different uh, uh, partition of this kind. So let's say you will have a bunch of these. So this dot 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 that we are adding are the configuration with the small action, let's call it minima, uh, that uh, uh, with different skin partition. So that's why from one you get more, okay, many. And minima is also already a new trivial, so these are supposed to be minima. This is already a trivial sum. <coughs> this may not be existent because of flat values. So the fact that you get minima is already a trivial result. It's already a finished result of its own. So if this is the case, and I will uh, now explain to you when this is the case, that you get minima, you get some bunch of configuration difference. Now, from here, so these are configuration, since you know there are thermal fluctuation, we 
you want to be sure that now you are close enough in these points, <coughs> essentially, the Monte Carlo is telling you that these points are supposed to be close enough to the natural minimum. <coughs> so this configuration here for different partitions you know, are telling you that now we, we are, well, okay, let's say optimistically that we are both here at the actual minimum. Okay? And now we, from here you can run an either a Newton, Newton uh, Rapson or uh, this uh, method just to actually to refine your meaning. Now you can do it, because now if you wish, uh, you have probed the global structure, you believe that you are close to the global minimum, and now you can deterministically improve your, 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 uh, your minimum using a, a deterministic method. So this is what we do, and at the end of this procedure, we get what we call a possible solution to the safety, completed solution to the yeah. Now, uh, just again, this is a bit, a bit uh, quick here. So as a consistency check, you can also do the following. Uh, well, you can first of all combine a different Monte Carlo with different delta star, or also here some minima will not have the maximum number of operators, so they will have an effective cutoff, cutoff which is smaller. So what you can do, you can plot in, uh, you, you can, uh, in, as a function of delta star and of this action S here, you can uh, see where this minimum are, uh, are, and then you can see that maybe a, a, the very same physical theory might appear in different minima. Suppose there is a physical theory in some operator, and the very same operator appears in this other. So this might be, say, the same minimum of, of another of another safety, which uh, here by chance in Monte Carlo got to one operator more. So what I want to say is that these minima are not going to be. Well, you don't know whether they are uh, CFT or fake minima. Okay, still you, you don't know, but they might even corresponds to the same either fake minimum or the same actual CFT because they can, if they have operator in common you might argue that this is the case and also the OP coefficients are very close. So you can recombine them. When you recombine the ideal situation where minima which are similar minima they should display a pattern of this kind. So suppose that these are the three minimum that you find out after this process, which, have, which share the same operators, then you see that better it is that the, the, the minima with more operators and the higher delta star has an action which is, uh, which is decreasing in, in, in a monotonic way. Remember, this is, uh, this is supposed to go to minus two. Okay? So you can put together such kind of minima and then declare that the putative solution, the best case scenario is just this point the best solution to process. So in other, in other words, you can reassemble your minimum, identify the one which should correspond to the very same theory, check that this pattern is satisfied, which is already a nice check, because if you get something like this, clearly something is going wrong. If at some point the reaction goes up, this is, uh, this is not a good, a good solution to crossing. Okay, so if this happens, you are you are happy and you believe more that this might be, might be a putative safety. Okay? So, um, yeah. So this is it. So <coughs> let me now, because I, I, I miss me that, let me now comment about the results. So what we got out of this analysis. <coughs> So uh, the reason so I call it this, the, the external field sigma is that uh, is because I'm imposing a zero symmetry. So the, if there are going to be a zero symmetry, this is not going to be crucially a symmetry of the CFT. As you know, this is a symmetry of the correlator, which is very different. But it's important that the correlator has an effective zero symmetry. 
uh, this is an important assumption and uh, um, the mo even more important one is that uh, in most of the cases uh, we will assume that there is only one relevant scalar one z2 even relevant scalar and then uh, uh, also, I don't have time anymore, so uh, we will only start now here in which we impose the presence of an energy moment intensity. This is not crucial. I mean, we also studied no longer theories, but now just let me focus on this case. And again, also unitary is going to be impossible. So we are studying unitary local theories with, uh, uh, with one, just one uh, critical, not multi-critical, with a Z2 effective uh, uh, discrete synthesis. Okay? So essentially, we are going, I'm sh showing you the following. So first, what we get when the external operator is free to be valid? Because this game that I was telling you, you can also play with the external operator. So when you do a move, you move not only the exchange of one, but even the external one. Why not? So we will see, I will show you what we get when we vary everything. Then uh, just a toy. The toy, uh, but clean environment. We will see what happens when we have one operator per spin, and then we will. Uh, I will comment on the more interesting, realistic case of having more operators per spin. Okay. So the first uh, interesting, uh, well, to me at least, interesting result is already here. So when you play this game and you let the external operator to be free, and in this case you can even remove this assumption here. So the scalars can be any, so you no longer assume one relevant scalar. What we find that in fact there is there is only one minimum. There are no minima, there are values. Because if you wish we constrain it, the safety parameter space is not enough constrained. And uh, there are valleys. <coughs> and only one minimum, which is the global minimum, which not surprisingly is going to be the free theory. <coughs> but this is in two and three dimensions, sorry, three and four in two dimensions, it's not a free theory, it's just the identity fault. So you collapse in the identity fault, which is okay. But let, let's have in mind the three and four dimension here. So now I will try, now we start the drawing the session of the talk. I hope I will be able to convey. I suggest you to read the, to, not as an advertisement, but just to read, look at the plot in the paper just to have a better features. I will try my best. So this is what we got in the delta sigma, <coughs> delta epsilon play when you allow delta sigma to run. So let me put in red the usual. Uh, uh, so Z2 even, Z2 is always impossible. Okay, so this is always there. So this is uh, one alpha. This is the point one. So this is the usual bound, the rigorous booster bound I was doing before. But this is the, the missing point. And uh, this is what we get. So if you start, let's say anywhere. So these points that I'm doing now are points where uh, essentially delta zero projected into this plane. So the starting point of the process I was telling you. start everywhere, in the middle, in the forbidden region, no matter where you start. The, I will now draw a line which is the time evolution. So this is like an RG time. So this is how the trajectory do. So again, this is t equal to zero, the Monte Carlo starting time, delta of zero, and this is the final Monte Carlo, where the Monte Carlo goes. Doesn't matter how many spin you have. Okay? The free theory is normal, there is one operator per spin. Here you start with a bunch of operators per spin, whatever, doesn't matter. You start from a point, if it is in this allowed region, the Monte Carlo was to leave it as soon as possible, understandably. Then you reach the extremality point, and then you follow the extremality region in this way. Now, I, this is the extremality region with, with the approximation we are doing. Of course, we are not as good as the 
is the full uh, loose trap, but this is very close to the extreme temperature. If you start here, more or less the same, you do this and then you move here. If you start here, <coughs> again you do this. And interestingly enough, this is maybe the first, uh, not totally obvious. If you start here, you don't go there, but you go to another extremality line, which is uh, which is in the middle of the interior region, this way. If you start here, you want to go to this way. So this is the only one zero to even a relevant scalar? No, this is with an arbitrary number of ah, the, uh, okay. Because there was 5-4, otherwise it would be disallowed, right? The free theory has a scaling dimension for 5-4 uh, at 2. Well, so if you had demanded only one z to even an element scalar, you would get rid of the free theory, right? Uh, no, no, as I told you, the, 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 you can uh, uh, sh shut off uh, okay, the way. Yeah, off yeah, off yeah, there, there, sorry, the, the, this plot, this, this assumption is not taken. This okay. assumption, I, I wrote it here because it's for the, for the future of the Sassan condition. But here, no, the only, the only uh, it's just the z to symmetry of the correlator. This, this is uh, this is. The so this is essentially what you get. So how it works, just to repeat the picture, right? So if you, at any of these points, you can have many operators, but these operators are shut down. So if you have many scalars, one scalar is going to become the epsilon of the free theory, scaling the mesh of one. All the others are shut down. Shut down means that the, after this, uh, the Monte Carlo procedure, they are zero of the coefficient. Okay? So no matter how many scalars we have at the beginning, as long as you along this flow, at some point the OP coefficient shuts off. It's zero. And you go to the free theory. Free theory all the time. There is, there is only left minimum. Okay? So these are the I mean the two interesting uh, uh results here are the fact that uh, we know that if you are sufficiently general, there are no minima in the parameter space uh, according to this action, but but valleys, uh, uh, regions in which you satisfy crossing. And crossing <coughs> is uh, satisfied along the special lines in particular, okay? which means uh, satisfied uh, um, in the parameter space, there are uh, regions, say sub-manifold, which uh, here it becomes line in this slice, in this uh, uh, special slice of the delta sigma delta epsilon plane, becomes one-dimensional lines, which are very specific. So one is probably not totally unexpected to you, which is the extremality line. We knew already, in particular from the extrema functional work by Scheer and Miguel, that the extremality line is special. It's known that you can systematically construct along what they call it the flow, in fact, precisely this flow, that it's relatively easy to get solution to cross. This is indeed the extrema functional method. Sorry, so to... what is uh, what is uh, yeah? Sorry, just to finish. So uh, the, the the new feature is the presence of another line deep into the uh, allowed region, which looks to be also special, where crossing is uh, more likely satisfying. That's uh, essentially the qualitative result of this feature. Yes, something simple and kind. Yes, sorry, but, uh, uh, here you're moving right. So the RG, so these valleys are like the bottom of the valley has a steepness. So you you want to satisfy crossing only at the free time, but on the extrema solution we know, at least within the actually not the allowed region, with the continuum number of operators that you can put in the numerical group, so there are solutions to crossing. There are, yeah, indeed, indeed. But you see that there's also the ice. Of course, we know that it's the point. The ice, of course, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. But so this is different. <laughs> no, no, sorry, this is different. Here I'm claiming that the icing pod, which is, of course, I'm not claiming, sorry, just to be clear, of course, I'm not claiming that the only safety in three dimensions is the free field. Otherwise, yeah. uh, you should keep, you should uh, just take me to the hospital, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> simply claiming that uh, the, the, the pattern of this uh, safety uh, landscape or safety data, as probed by this action, is not glassy as I was showing you the, uh, at the beginning, but as uh, modular species. In other words, here there is a valley which has, uh, at given delta star, at, at a given truncation, is tilted a little bit. These are all CFDs, but since uh, you are free to move, the, the only actual minimum of this one is the free theory. 
In other words, uh, when the delta star goes to infinity, these are all the good theories where s is in minus infinity. But if you fix a specific whatever delta star, the value of the action, the minimum value of this s is uniquely given by the field theory, and the, all, all these other will have an higher value of s. Which is another way of saying that they are not, they are, they are, they are in the continuum. They are not individual little uh, glassy minima one after the other, but there is a continuum. This is the point of view. So okay. just to be sure, so the steepness goes down as you The steepness goes down, down yes. Okay. Otherwise, you will, uh, for instance, you, you might stop at the icing point, right? Or <coughs> some other point. But uh, I, I'm still a bit confused by, by how can there be uh, like a node. So is, is the claim that as delta goes to infinity, except that the extrema line and this other extrema line, the gap doesn't go down? This, the, the gap, I mean, the, the minimum doesn't go to zero like inside the log region? No, the claim is that, uh, I mean, I cannot make a claim for delta star goes to, to, to infinity because my delta star is... Uh, but for instance, when you increase it, it doesn't, it, that's the only place where, it, where it's... Uh, yeah, no matter what delta star is, as, as long as uh, it's a word uh, the, the numbers I've been proving, which is not admittedly very large, it, but within the region 10, 15, the regime we've been exploring, there is no difference. This is, we always land here with uh, yeah you always land here. I cannot tell you how fast so to say you land here, right? But you always land here, which is an indication of the fact that all the CFT which well we don't know really how it is populated this uh, extremity line, but whatever it is, it is uh, it, it is uh, um, there are no minima. There are no as well or if you wish sorry, I mean I don't want to, to be to make too strong statement. If there are they are invisible to our uh, accuracy, to our definition. But now let me contrast this, because sorry, I'm taking time, with the fact that if you, if you now fix that sigma, the story is completely different. So I don't want to, sorry, I don't want to, to go on, because the, 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 this is just the story when you let the, the external operator to be free, but it's enough, it's enough if you wish. This should be contrasted with the fact that if, uh, say, you fix the external operator, and then you make slice and fix the delta sigma, this flow is stopped. So this is an indication that this, is, this value is not a multidimensional. We don't have such a higher dimensional uh, values there, but it's a specific uh, finite dimensional values. But anyhow, this is, uh, I would say, probably one of the most qualitative important results, the appearance of special lines in the interior of the allowed region, which, uh, which appears on this analysis as special. Yes. Um, did you impose here the stress tensor, the existence of the stress tensor? Yes, yes, I'm imposing the existence of the stress tensor. And by the way, this is important. The existence of the stress tensor seems to be important. And, and, yeah, if you don't, did you fight also the generalized free theory? If you don't, what, what, what happens to the generalized free field? Yeah, if you, uh, well, I, I, I will show you, all, I will comment on this. Yes, generalized free theory also. Yeah, by the way, in two dimensions, this is uh, something peculiar we still don't understand. In two dimensions, this line act actually is, uh, is uh, coincides with the GFT line. So let me draw here the GFT line. So this is the, uh, the line of generalized free theories. This is the line, the, the, this feature I was uh, drawing here was supposed to be for three dimensions. A similar feature, a little bit dirtier, applies to four dimensions. This line is a little bit below, and then goes up in four dimensions. And in two dimensions instead, this line is not like this. Okay, so now let me draw, try to draw the two-dimensional case. Two-dimensional case, uh, I don't have the, the actual plot, so this is going to be now really a cartoon. Uh, so this is going to be along the GFT. So the GFT line is the line which uh, allows you to land. If, of course, as I told you, there is no free theory point in two dimensions, so the, the point here will be the point in which you have the identity. So at some point, everything collapses because the identity contribution uh, is singular in our case. Okay? So, the, the, so you, you cannot really reach this point. But there is a runway towards the, the, the point, the zero, zero point in two dimensions. Okay, along the JFD line. Okay, so uh, let's then move on because there are a few other possibly interesting results. So now, if you fix that the city, you can then finish in five minutes. Yes, yes, I will uh, by uh, by speeding up a lot. So. 
if you fix delta sigma, then uh, uh, as I told you, you stop this uh, this behavior and uh, and the minima are developed. For instance, uh, so you can look uh, just as a common case at one operator per spin and i equal to one for each spin channel. So here you might ask if you wish this also a really interesting question. You might ask is the free theory the only theory of this kind or not? Well, obviously it should be the free theory because we know the range of trajectory and interacting theory should have an infinite number of range of trajectories. But you don't know where this range of trajectory is start. So if you have a, a severe truncation, who tells you that you have a sparse spectrum the same range of trajectory is very high? So in principle, you might want to know whether you can have theories in which you have one operator of the spin up to some scaling dimension. So this is, if you wish, the sort of uh, question you can have in mind. So in this case, again, let me draw the three-dimensional case. So what I'm drawing here is the analysis at fixed delta sigma. So it's a different story now. And then this is what you get. So this is, uh, again, a different theory point. This is always delta epsilon versus delta sigma. And uh, so these are lines where the, the I'm drawing here ISO curvature, I don't know how to call it, but I mean, these lines where the action is particularly uh, small. And uh, you get here the free theory minimum. And then you get some other minimum. For instance, you get the minimum here, which is uh, close to actual IC point, you get the minimum here. And then you get other minima here. Okay, so the, the, this is discrete because we are probing only, these are the points we have been probing. So delta sigma is fixed. So at each value of delta sigma fixed that we probe, this analysis, uh, this Monte Carlo analysis that I, I, I've been showing to you, produces minima. So in particular, these minima are a finite number. <coughs> if delta sigma is close enough, you get two. And then at some point, you only get in this uh, interior of the allowed region. OK? Then, uh, well, OK, it's interesting that you get the minimum roughly where the icing is. Of course, it shouldn't be the icing. This is one operator per spin. The icing has not one operator per spin, so it shouldn't be icing, of course. Um, so, sorry, by the way, this is, uh, uh, I'm doing this, uh, sorry, it was too fast. So this is 55, the icing is actually. It's not that close to the S because it's, it's an other delta sigma. So, and uh, you can check, you can also check uh, how this minimum as a function of delta star work. And then uh, with this analysis, you realize that the only consistent set of, uh, of minima that goes down consistently are of the free theory. So, from this point here, you see that as delta star increases, S decreases while uh, for this whole other point, these are going to be fake points. So either they do not even uh, resemble as a function that are star, they are completely isolated, or they stay constant. So out of this analysis, essentially, you realize that, uh, that uh, uh, the free theory indeed is the only consistent theory, and you can get, you get other minima which are fake. So you see that this fake, uh, uh, the problem of fake minima at least with such a resolution of delta star, is not completely solved by the Monte Carlo. Okay? So you can... But the point which is maybe... Um, maybe or maybe not interesting is that you see that there are two disconnected regions here where they, the, they, they are not connected. While if you allow for unitarity and you ask yourself where are the points where the action is minimum, I'll, uh, for one operator per spin, allowing non unitary region, then you nicely find uh, such uh, the two points reconnect into the non unitary region. So you have to go uh, below one half, and then these two disconnected region they combine. So this line that I'm doing here is the line of minimum action when you let the Monte Carlo vary with one operator of the spin. So once again, you see that there are this special line, which is again, externality line. So now it's even at some non-unitary point, and then it goes up, goes uh, exit here, below the, the, in the middle of the interior region, where the, the solution are, are more easily satisfied. 
yeah, sorry, to run up. So for uh, the more interesting case of more operator per spin, so this is where things now become interesting. Uh, so in this case, the analysis is, uh, is uh, not as good as uh, this one. So here, just to give an idea, of course, uh, when we <coughs> reach the Monte Carlo, reach the free theory, the free theory is reached with a lot of accuracy. Mm, scheme dimension of OPE matches uh, very well. When uh, we are more operator per spin, the analysis becomes uh, a bit rough at the quantitative level, with the excep exception of the two-dimensional case. The two-dimensional case is uh, very good, so let me at least comment quickly on the two-dimensional case. So now we are in the setup of the full-fledged setup. So you have a more operator per spin, and you want to look for solution. Uh, here it is absolutely crucial to have uh, this condition. Because the number of CFT in two dimension is uh, is amazing, and you know. That. Even if you go, if you, if, you, if you focus only on minimal models, not to mention all rational quantum theory or continuous Hubble theory whatsoever, only with minimal models, since you can have essentially for any fixed delta sigma at will, okay, you will have uh, even if you fix it to be square root of two, then you know there will be a rational number close to. 1 over square root of 2, it will be a rational number very close to the square root of 2, and with that rational number, be sure that there is some minimal model, or even more than one, that will have an operator with that scaling dimension. Then uh, that uh, minimal model will have possibly a large uh, value of, uh, it will be a large n minimal model, and then you will have a large many, many operators. But this will be in our allowed region. So the Field identification tells you that already minimal models can cover almost the whole allowed region. Simply changing what you mean by sigma, you can, uh, you can cover the whole uh, allowed region. This is drastically simplifies if you, if you demand uh, one relevant scalars. All this disappears, and you are left with the typical that we have been seeing minimal models lying in the extremized region. These minimal models here. <coughs> I've been studying, so this is the two-dimensional, we have a two-dimensional now, so this is the two-dimensional icing, the, the first minimal model, and then here you have other minimal models. I want to make it clear that minimal models do not live here. Minimal models live everywhere, simply depending on what you call delta sigma. So with the specific field assignment, in, for which uh, sigma sigma is equal to 1 plus epsilon, so the fusion rule are very simple. With this specific assumption, which by the way, I have a fake z symmetry, this is not the, the actual z symmetry of the minimal models, but okay, I don't want to, to comment on this. With this specific field assignment where delta sigma is a specific field, okay, then we have, uh, we can say that the minimal models lives here. I want this to make it clear because this is a point that can be a confusion. Okay? So it requires crucially this assumption. So with this crucial assumption, you can uh, carve out a lot of two-dimensional CFT and hope that you get any, because otherwise it's a mess. As well. it's, and the reason why we want to study two-dimensional theory is that uh, it's the only dimension which we have exact result, and we can uh, check what if we are getting this numerical nonsense or something interesting. So here, at the, at the very least, this is what we got. So if this is the full uh, bound, uh, the bound I put in here, the one by Connor, the Connor in two dimensions uh, with exactly with this uh, relevant scalar. So you see that there is also a line, uh, the allowed region now is, uh, you, you carve out some region if you demand all the one relevant scalar. This line is actually a little bit below, I don't do very well. So what we get is uh, essentially like for each delta sigma we get a minimum. And then we get minima along the, along the a parallel line, which is the GFT line. Just it. for each delta sigma, we get two classes of minima, at the extremality line and along the GFT line, which I, I recall the GFT line is the line of minimum action to the mission. Now, I had to cut it, uh, the story. I think you should really conclude. Yes, exactly. So I want to just to conclude. So these points here are very nicely the generalized minimal models that they have been studied by Pedro, Balz, and Leonardo, and then again by, by Connor. So this, we know that there are effective uh, conformal theories for any M. 
and this I hold, I mean, the satisfaction of the properties to be general minimal model, so we are happy that we got some interesting theories. <coughs> Here, we have not been able to identify these putative uh, theories, and the reason is that uh, the accuracy we have is not enough to say whether this is, uh, despite we are imposing delta t equal to d, if uh, you see, if delta sigma is null, d and d plus. Uh, uh, and uh, plus uh, two delta sigma are not very different, and uh, it's not clear to us whether these are actual local theories, maybe n equal to two mini minimal models, generalized n equal to two minimal models, or other theories, or simply numerical artifact of just GFTs. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, in three and four dimensions, the, the analysis is not as good as this one, and of course, we don't have, uh, we don't know the theories, but we get. Uh, we can get minimum at the extremality region and again along this other special line in the allowed parameter space. So of course we yeah, are to cut it short. I to jump, let me just conclude. You can also, I mean you can start for instance the Yangling model and, and say two dimensions, things look very nice and you identify the, the minimum the non meter minimum. Let me just if you give me one minute. No. Okay. I have no sorry. Yeah, I completely got out. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I thought. No, I think yeah, yeah, we should ask the questions over there. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. Thank you. So, quickly, uh, let's start at 11.30.